Do you remember the great presidential battle of 1992? Now, you may think I'm talking about George Bush against then Governor Bill Clinton, but I'm not. I'm talking about Kathy Rush versus Aunt Georgie over the dinner table. Man, I saw it right in front of my face. I was 20 years old at the time, and I watched one person advocate for the Republican Party and another person advocate for the Democratic Party. And you know what? There wasn't a whole lot of consensus in between the two. And it was the first time I realized, you know what? Not everybody agrees, not even in our family. And it was the first time I saw inside of the family circle disagreements when it came to politics. Well, listen, maybe in your family it's different, but in most families it's gotten worse. In fact, every Thanksgiving and every Christmas, there are articles all over the internet talking about how you can get along with your family members that you disagree with politically. And the last election didn't make it any better. But wouldn't you know it? There's actually a way to have a political conversation with friends and relatives so that by the end of the conversation, you're not angry or discouraged, but you actually understand each other better. And I know that because I've lived that. And so on today's episode of Ed Talks, I'm going to interview one of my best friends, a good man and a person who I disagree with on quite a few political issues. Jabez Lebret and I first, and by the way, that's how you pronounce his name. I've known him for a while. Jabez Lebret and I first met each other about 10, 12 years ago when he came to me as a coaching member. I was actually helping him in his business. He was so good at what he did online that I actually hired him to start helping me with some of my consulting clients. And he was so good at that that we actually started a business together, which we grew and then sold. And now we're just lifelong friends. We get together for breakfast, have a cup of coffee, talk through the issues, maybe have a beer later on that night and talk through the issues. And through it all, even though we didn't always understand each other, and even though we got a little frustrated sometimes, we never got angry. We never called each other dirty words. We never hung up the phone on each other, and we remain lifelong friends. And so in today's episode, we're going to talk about how you can have a political conversation, but be awesome about it. And I got to tell you about my buddy Jabez. Ever since uh, we sold that company, he's gone on uh, to do what I call ready, fire, aim. He's a person who sees issues in the world. And instead of like most people, when people see issues in the world, they talk about it and whine about it and complain about it, but they never do anything about it. Jabez is the kind of guy that does something about it. And he's got a passion for changing the world of education. And he doesn't just have a passion for doing it, but he's actually doing it. He and his wife right now are starting a new breed of school. And the first one is right here in San Diego. We're going to get to that towards the end of the episode. So grab a pen, grab something to write with. We're going to cover a lot of issues very fast, and we're going to have a lot of fun. On to episode five. All right, I'm sitting next to my man, Jabez, who uh, we've got like a, a fun history. I said in the introduction that we've disagreed on a lot of things politically, but we've yeah. never argued, and we've always no. been good friends. And I'm always interested in someone's story, their political formation. Our beliefs are formed a lot of times by the stories of our lives. So take me back to when Jabez was like, you know, a newborn. A little, little tadpole. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little tadpole, Jabez. <laughs> oh, man. There's a, I, be like a little Rick and there, Morty cartoon about that. I, there should be. Point. There probably is somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I, I had a, a pretty tumultuous childhood. Uh, you know, my mom's mentally ill, and I, I grew up with her in and out of the hospital, and it, it had a pretty dramatic impact on the long run. Um, you know, I look at high school. I ended up homeless when I was 16, and that obviously had a pretty negative impact on my ability to participate in school, and ultimately didn't graduate from high school, and I'd say a lot of growing up poor in, in that scenario of life definitely shaped a lot of the way that I view things. So you, uh, so you were homeless in high school, but yeah. somehow you managed to get into Gonzaga University. Tell me that story. It, it, you like twisted little, the arm of the admissions director or something, wasn't that? Wasn't well, that when I first, I, I actually <laughs> went in twice. Uh, the first, the first time that I went in, uh, they, you know, I had no diploma, I had no SATs, I had no money, and I sat down and said, "Hi, I've got nothing. I'd like to go to your university." And they kind of, I, I, they laughed a little bit. Like I don't blame them. They they were being very nice about it. They said, "Hey, you should try the community college down the street," <laughs> uh, which is. <laughs> Which is great. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of community colleges, but it just wasn't... But that wasn't for you. Not the answer for me. Yeah. Not at that time. So I had set an appointment with the Dean of Admissions the following week. Got my GED that weekend. Went back in and said, hey, uh, I'm going to this school. <laughs> Period. I don't, you, you tell me how to get in here because I am going to Gonzaga University for all four years. 
and this is where I want to get my degree from, and uh, you, you either let me in or I will find another way. And he said, all right. He said, all right. He said, go take your, we'll proctor your SAT exams uh, this, this oh, so weekend. you didn't and even have the SAT, when you walked into his no, office? No, I just had my GED. <laughs> <laughs> like, I had just taken you know the test. Do you know how many kids had applied to Gonzaga? And gotten those little thin letters yeah. of rejection, you know, because their community service it's, wasn't up. And then you just walked in the office and just said, I'm going to this school. Years later, I, I actually asked that very question. I, <laughs> I, was, I was like, why? I had no money. I had, I had literally nothing. And I was like, I didn't seem to fit the profile of their traditional student. And they said, you know, one of the reasons that they were excited about having a student like me in the system as a non-traditional student is that I brought to the, the institution some of that kind of determination. Yeah. That, that they believe is valuable and, and, and you know to Jesuits to their credit their their belief is to help those that, that are in need and that's kind of I was in that position and that's kind of uh, well we're gonna get to your school in a little bit but that's kind of your belief isn't it that was yeah. formed off of that so you okay so you grew up with some difficulties at home uh, and I know more of the story so you witnessed some vi- some some violence in in terms of firearm violence you also were homeless and then you talked your way into a great school so how did that how did your story inform your political beliefs? Because when we first came together, like I mentioned in the introduction, we we came from polar opposite views. Yes. And yet we still hang out with each other and still like each other. And actually, we've come to see each other eye to eye on some things in the last 10 years, too, which is interesting, right? We have. I, I It was always professional at the beginning when we first met right. and then became friends and, and still were able to make, you know navigate the pathways of, of conversations and and dinners and breakfasts and, and everything else. <laughs> beer. I beer. A lot, lot of beer yes. over the years. Uh, for me, politically, I always looked to the institutions that I felt were, were there to most support and help the people like me. And and that's really like, and, and in, in my, you know, my, my family, if you will, were pretty conservative. And so... You know, they were Pentecostal when I was a kid and grew up rather conservative. On, and that wasn't and that wasn't the environment you wanted growing up. So not when I got older, I, I chose my own path. Yeah. And, you know, I would say most all of them were Republican and I went, you know, full bore Democrat, you know, right right before I even started college and certainly, you know, afterwards and I continued to develop my political beliefs. Um, I leaned in on the Democrat Party. Yeah, I mean and to define full bore Democrat, this isn't somebody who just believes. I mean, you were act you're very, I don't know, you probably still are, you're very active in terms of voter recruitment, getting people out. Yep. I mean, you, when, when Jabez LeBret does something, <laughs> this is something you need to know, when he does something, he doesn't like write about it and then go, I feel like I've accomplished something. Like, dude goes all in. Yeah. I mean, I, I marched in Boston when we were going into Iraq the first time. I've been to many marches, planned many rallies. I've been yeah as, as politically active as I as I can afford the time to be you know so let's take this Iraq uh, march it would, it would be an interesting place to just pause for a moment because I think this is an area so part of my story part of my political story I grew up in a, in a conservative family uh, my mom was growing and running businesses and my mom's issue she didn't like paying t- excessive, excessive taxes really it's, it's what can <laughs> no, who does right and really what came down to it and so my I was raised by an entrepreneurial mom a woman, you know, who had this uh, chip on her shoulder because of what she felt was oppressive. And you grow up learning things like that, you know, and you start forming your opinions. So so I went into the military and I want to take you back to two snapshots. You're in Boston uh, and you're protesting. When was that? 2002, 2003? 2003 yeah. Right about when we did the Right the before the search. shock and awe. And I'm, I'm in the military mm-hmm. about to go participate in that. So in that precise moment, if I was walking through Boston that day and I saw your protest, I would have been offended. I would have been angry. I would have been like, yeah. dude, freaking non-American, do patriot. You know, I would have said those things. But now looking back, what, 16 years later, I, I see that you had a point there. Like, <laughs> like legit, like, I mean, you, you had, you were seeing things that I wasn't seeing because of some cognitive dissonance. I mean. And, and this, the same too, though. I mean, I think that I, I would have looked outside of, the march, and had I seen, let's say that you were in your your military attire, and I would have said, you know, there's somebody serving their country and following orders. They have yeah. a job. They have a job to do, and for them, in their mind, they're they're doing their job the best of their ability to protect us, so that we can do this march. 
but I just don't think we should be going. Yeah, and I think that's place. the interesting thing about this discussion. So I'm not a Republican anymore, um, and part of the reason for that was I chose. I think it was probably five years ago. I was sitting right in this recliner, right in my office here, and I decided I wasn't going to agree with everything anymore. Because when you look at, like, take the Iraq War for example. Wherever your opinion is on that, by the way, um, we went to we went to war using some faulty intelligence. Let's just right. say it that way. Whether everybody it was, can agree on that, everybody, <laughs> that's the why I said it that way. Whether it was intentional, whether it was designed by Halliburton or you know Dick Cheney, it, look, we can leave those topics off. But we went to war based on some faulty, either faulty or outdated intelligence. We went to war potentially for the wrong reason. Uh, and so take that as an example, like five years ago, I'm sitting there and I realized I, I can't let my thoughts be formed anymore by what someone else tells me I ought to think about things. And so I took a moment, I took more than a moment, I took several years actually, and I went through every single issue and I spent several um, hours actually pretending I was the other person on the other side who I always thought was evil or dumb or you know, what they, you know, yeah. and then, but if you actually spend enough time in someone's shoes, you start to change your opinions about maybe not the issue, by the way, but you do change your opinions about them because you realize very few people in the world do things because they're awful and evil. You know, right. people yeah, have a reason not. for things, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, what was your, I, I feel the same way as my kind of growth in my political views over the years. Um, you know, I look at myself at 20, Two twenty-three, very different perspective, and and certainly over time have developed an appreciation, and empathy, that you don't want bad things to happen to people, and I and I don't either, and you want people who have needs to be helped, and so do I. I think maybe we just kind of disagree on how to do it, how to go yeah. about it, yeah. But that most all of us feel the same way. Yeah, I mean, we genuinely want to help each other out. If you take if you take a uber left liberal, I mean, statistically speaking, we're sort of 45%, 45%. Really, it's about 10% and 10% of the extreme right, extreme left. It's really actually six six and eight percent, but let's just say 10 and 10, and then everyone else kind of floats around the middle on some things. So let's take poverty, for example. You were homeless when you were in high school. There's not a person, a well-meaning person. Look, there's some crazy people, Don't, don't get me wrong. There's not a well-meaning person who looks at homelessness and says, well, that's somebody else's problem. I mean, everyone realizes it's a problem. We just disagree on how to fix the problem. And so do you think part of the solution in our country is coming back to the start? Like, we all agree it's a problem. Now let's talk about some issues. I mean, where, where, where do we lose the dialogue? That's an important first step, is that if we can find some common ground, we can then open up a dialogue. Right. And instead of coming at it as, you're wrong, if I, if I step into the conversation right out of the gate saying, whatever you say, it's going to be wrong, no matter yeah. what. Yeah. And, and our politicians certainly are good at this. Yeah, they're great And at the that. media yeah. makes a lot of money at, at talking this way. But I think in reality, if we sit down and talk about like, okay, do we agree this is a problem? Great. We have now found a common place to start. Yes. And then we can say, well, how are we going to fix it? Yeah. And I think actually the second question the first question's huge, right? What do we agree on? Because we can start there. And by the way, I know you don't believe me watching this, but you can do this with every issue, even the most divisive ones. I'm telling you, I've done this. On, you can start with something uh, yes. you agree with, okay? The next the next question becomes the harder question because then the, the next question is one of two things. It's either uh, who should be responsible for fixing this or who's going to pay for it? And that's where... I think we actually can agree more on the second question than we do now because a lot of times the next question, I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, the next answer goes, well, the government should. And almost always that leads to a faulty solution. You know, uh, We're going to talk about education a little bit and how we spent a lot of money on education for zero result. We've spent a lot of money in our government on a lot of things with zero things. results. We're both entrepreneurs and we've seen entrepreneurial solutions. So you've got one we're going to talk about in the education world, but do you see that as a solution to a lot more of our problems than just the ones that, that, that uh, like education? Yeah, I think that we are kind of entering into that, uh, I'd say, an entrepreneurial social age. Yeah. Where we're seeing entrepreneurship begin to find its way into social issues. And we're seeing some great solutions. Great solutions. Solving all sorts of problems from you know hunger, homelessness, water, you know fresh drinking water globally to domestic issues to you know solving climate issues. I mean, those are all important, big, huge issues. We generally... 
maybe lean into the government a little too much. In, in even being a Democrat, uh, I, I would be the first to say that that certainly regulations aren't always the answer and the government isn't always the one who's going yeah. to solve the problem. Well, I mean, it's, the track record isn't all that good. No. Um, and and if, by the way, coming just getting them to agree to do something is difficult, you know, without oh, shoving money into a whole bunch of other places in the meantime. It's virtually impossible. Nothing gets done clean. It's all it's Ooh. all got a ton of peripheral stuff that has nothing to do with the actual problem you're trying to solve. My my, my buddy is a, a friend of mine is a lobbyist in Louisiana, and he wrote a book called um, Laws and Sausages. You wouldn't want to know how either one is made. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I want to I want to talk. Let's talk about the Democratic Party for a second. Uh, two three videos ago, I described this f- fictional but real probably man in Boston. He's 67 years old. He's followed the uh, the Red Sox for his entire life. Not the Cubs. He's um, voted Democrat. He was a Labor Democrat. He was eight when John F. Kennedy said, "Ask not what you can do for your ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country." Uh, and over the last ten years, uh, really, probably more like over the last three or four years, he's seen the party really shift off of the beliefs that he has. I mean, this is a traditional guy who goes to Catholic mass every week. Um, do you think the party has left him? Do you think your party has departed from the traditional core Democrat, or do you think it's heading in the direction that it needs to go, or both? It's it's gone. Really? It, from what it was originally standing for, I think that we've seen the Democrat Party used to support what I would say was the working people. Yeah, yeah. The, the individual trying to do their best to better themselves and keep things moving yeah. forward with an eye on making sure that those who are less fortunate or less capable get a get a hand to reach down and help pull them back up. Yep. And somehow now it seems that there's the that I don't know if it's the social I don't know if it's social media, I don't know if it's 24/7 news cycle. I mean it's probably a combination of a lot of things that has pushed the Democrat Democratic Party to start talking about things like a thousand dollars a month for every single person. Yeah. Or, you know, completely eradicating the healthcare system altogether. It is so complicated you can't just do that. That's not realistic. Um, and the solutions that we're coming up with now uh, seem pandering to to maybe that tiny far side that isn't that's the maybe the loudest, but not necessarily where we all yeah. probably sit. I, I'm with you, man. And I'll tell you, I'll go to the side that I came from. I, I like like I watched Reagan say tear down this wall, you know, <laughs> and. Um, and I watched Reagan say government wasn't the solution to the problem. Government was the problem, you know, and like, I think I was in high school or like, you know, yeah, you know, cheering <laughs> along with this great communicator. Uh, and then I watched, we talk about the Iraq war. Then I watched George, George Bush, the second George Bush spend like twice as much money as Bill Clinton did in eight years. And I was upset about that spending. But you have to look at the numbers. It wasn't but twice it was, as much. It was a lot. It was a lot, it was more. A lot it was more. And. Uh, and I thought that's not that's not the Republican Party I was interested in. Like I wasn't interested in the one that took the money and just spent it wildly. Like I thought that was the other one. That's the way I had been trained. And so we look interestingly like at your at your the party that you came out of, the party that I came out of, and neither one represents the place where we came from. You know, and that makes talking about problems challenging. Yeah, because you're like, which one? Yeah, which one are we and, talking about? And it becomes almost trench warfare at that point. Where it's no longer sitting and having a conversation. It's now I'm on one side of the fence and you are on the other side. That's right. And there is no middle ground to be had. And that's a dangerous place to be in. Yeah, I mean, you, basically every two years you have you have the Republican and Democratic Party split into two factions and fight each other for six to 12 months. And then they get together and fight the other group for six months. And then there's an election and then they repeat the process again. Well, now uh, it's almost 24 months. Yeah, it's like it now, is. Now it just almost doesn't stop now. Yeah, I mean, we're watching, constant. we're recording this at, after the first round of Democratic debates, and, and we're a year and a half out of the, you know. Um, but by the way, I want to get back into the parties real quick, but before I do that, I want to go back to the original point. How do two guys like us disagree on some issues? How do we get together and have a beer or a cup of coffee over breakfast and still like each other when we're done talking about something that we still disagree with? How do we do that? How's that possible? I think that we both have always thought maybe there's something I could learn from the other person's yep. perspective. Because what you talked about earlier about when you were sitting down putting yourself in somebody else's shoes for a while, you can do that face to face. And we've never let the conversation, we've gotten frustrated. 
I think, at, at points in conver- conversations. And we've had some long conversations yeah. about politics. Yeah. And, and, some of the, the and some of the problems that we're trying to solve in, in making this country a better place for everybody. And sometimes, you know, I've shaken my head and been like, I just don't see how that could possibly work. And, and I have to ask a follow-up question. Like, help me understand how that would even be possible. And sometimes we're left with, well, I don't know that I have the full answer. Let yeah. me figure that out. That's an okay answer, by the way. That is okay. I tell you, this is one of the things, as you know, I'm putting together a third party and planning on running for I president and everything. That. So um, <laughs> one of the things that cracks me up is, as a presidential candidate, I don't think you need to have the answer to every every question. You know, how do we solve the healthcare crisis? You know what? I'm not sure the exact answer, but I know if I get the right people together, we can find it. Like that should be an amazing answer. Like in business, we never we never hire someone because they have the answer to ever. Like, as my social media coordinator, six months from now, what will you? I don't know. Like, <laughs> like, can you just trust me to do? You know, we never expect anyone to have the answer to every single question until they run for office, and then you're expect. And then so what? What you end up with? So right now, the political candidates who are all running for president on Politifact, which is hysterical to watch, are literally anywhere between forty to sixty percent truthful. I mean, think about that for a second. You know, like if 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 you and I, if I was eighty percent, we would have been oh, gone this time a long time yeah. ago. You know what I mean? So like forty to sixty percent. Anyway, so back to you. Well, but it's because it's impossible to be anywhere near a hundred percent if you're being expected to be so knowledgeable on so many things. Right. And and it, it really that's not what we should. That's not what a leader is. A leader isn't someone who knows all of the answers to everything. A leader is someone who is able to bring people together to find solutions to problems. That's right. So we should start looking for leaders, maybe, and stop looking for people who can just solve it. Hey, man, that's good. Because it doesn't work. Start looking for leaders. Um, I'll talk about that in the first episode. By the way, if you haven't watched Horse Manure Leadership, episode one of Ed Talks. Best back title. It. An episode, <laughs> title. You said this fun. Jabez sent me a, um, a, a text that day, and he's like, Horse Manure Leadership. <laughs> that's it that's so, all that it's um, I have a great um, production uh, team and one of my I had a different name for it it was it was worse and she's like I think horse manure leadership I'm like yes, yes. that's the one um, alright so I want to jump onto the political side but I want to talk about corporations so um, and I'll take you back two years ago the, the, the day after Donald Trump was elected I was at a big event on the east coast Ninety uh, percent of the people at the event were liberal, progressive leaning. So, um, so there's a very small majority. Felt like a funeral. It was, dude. People, it was, I'm not it was kidding. Pretty insane. It, there were people crying out loud, like you know when you go to like a a funeral and people are wailing. Yeah. <laughs> like literally, we, there's people crying. Um, we didn't take that loss very well. <laughs> I'm like, wow. They're <laughs> like really. Upset I think about in this. sports, <laughs> in sports, we learned you're supposed to lose gracefully. Like you're supposed to keep your head up a little bit. We didn't. We Ooh, lost it. It was like it's strange. In in I was there for like two and a half days, and in two days it went from like disbelief to to like weeping and wailing to like oh, anger. We went through the five stages of grief. It like really quickly. And then by the te- second half day, they were making plans. I'm like, wow, that happened quickly. Like they're like <laughs> working on this, you know? Anyway, um, I was talking to somebody who is, who is a, a, a very high executive at Google. Uh, and, um, and I was just talking with her. It wasn't, we were having a political conversation, but she wasn't doing well. And I said, are you okay? You know, Cause I just cared about her as a person. And she goes, I think I need to go home. Uh, and, and I said, why? And she goes, well, my whole community at Google is in mourning right now. And I felt for her, by the way, because I understand what it feels like to have everyone around you mm-hmm. in such, such agony, even though I didn't share that particular thing. And by the way, I didn't vote for either one of the uh, candidates in 2020. I wrote myself in. Uh, if you want to know the answer, I, <laughs> I voted my conscience. Um, and so, um, but uh, later on, reflecting on the conversation, I thought, there's one of the largest corporations in the world that now believes we just elected Hitler and they're all in mourning and that has to affect how the corporation operates. Mm. And we've seen that. Um, but I'm wondering what your opinion, I have, by the way, I'm mixed on this uh, and I'll share you my opinion in a second, but I wonder what your opinion is regarding corporations and their wield of influence and power in the political sphere. I, I don't think we're going to get away from it. Yeah. The corporations are powerful. They have a lot of money. They employ a lot of people. They um, are have a large economic in, impact on communities, and so they're they're interwoven into the system. Um, an expectation that they wouldn't be a part of the political side as well is unrealistic. Whether that's out in the open or behind closed doors, I'd rather it's out in the open. I prefer that approach. I'm with you on that. If it's gonna be, if it's gonna happen, I'd rather we have some visibility into it. 
instead of it happening behind closed doors. Uh, with that said, I think that corporations should not forget that they have a lot of stakeholders. You got that right, man. And they, they sometimes do. And I'm all about political activism, obviously, right? I'm an active person in doing that as an individual. Um, unlike some other people, I don't believe that corporations are individuals. They might be on a tax form. Yeah. I don't think that they're actually. So you disagree with Citizens people. United and. Uh... Maybe just a tax. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I do too, actually. So. I, I think that they have a, a responsibility to all of the stakeholders of the organization. That's not just their employees, that's right. their shareholders, that's their leadership, that's the, their consumers yeah. of their products. And they should be a little bit more cautious, maybe. Just in, in jumping into the foray. Yeah, I mean, I asked a hard question, and and uh, uh, full transparency, I don't have a great answer. I don't have a solid answer to that. Again, it comes back to this whole: you have to have the answer to everything when you're running uh, for president. And free market repercussions are pretty swift. That's these days. exactly, so. exactly, exactly where I lean on. Um, because ultimately, you have a business. I have a business. We at one point had a business together. Google is a business. It's a company, and uh, I don't like the idea of the government getting involved in businesses. It's t it tends to create problems. Um, go back to 2008, yeah. and you can see how that how that creates problems. Uh, look at the Nike situation with the tennis shoe, when Colin Kaepernick said, we yeah. shouldn't, you shouldn't have that tennis shoe up, you know, be released because of, you know, racial tension, this, that, or the other, because of the symbolism of the flag. The problem is Colin Kaepernick, although I may personally tend to agree with some of the stuff that he does. He is not an expert nor a study historian <laughs> yeah. in these things and maybe shouldn't be the one that is consulting the organization because yeah. the Anti-Defamation League, who does retain databases of all of this information, came out and said, uh, actually, that's not really <laughs> yeah. correct. Yeah. And you know, I, I think, man, are we really to a point now where that's how we're getting our information and how we're choosing, how corporations are choosing to interject themselves in the, the political I mean, you side take Nike as an example. Uh, I have Nike clothes. But uh, I, di I didn't. I didn't like the move of the flag. Uh, I thought, man, it's like Fourth of July, and it's a flag. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and it's a it, flag. Literally, there's nothing negative. <laughs> it's a flag. A flag at all. And um, and when they did that, I thought, I have a lot of choices in golf gear, man, and I don't need to get Nike. And it's yeah. not like I'm going to lose out. I'm just going to wear something different. Uh, and and so in one sense, the corporation has a freedom to be able to do what they want as long as it's right and more ethical and not horrible. Um, at the same time, you have the right as a consumer to go buy from someone else or go use a different search engine. And the greatest thing about our, our world right now, I think not the greatest, but one of the greatest things is like when you go to a restaurant, you walk into the restaurant and on the wall, as you walk into the restaurant, there's this sign and it almost always says A and it's the health grade, right? So like every year somebody comes with like a clipboard and they're like, and you know the restaurant's on their best behavior when they get that thing. Oh, for sure. <laughs> but 365 days out of the year, people walk in with Yelp. And they give it a grade, too. And I don't make my restaurant decision based on the grade on the wall. Right. I've never done that. I've never been like, well, maybe we should go to Ray's Delicatessen. They've got an A. Like, I've never made the decision, but I have because of what someone says on Yelp. And so because of the fast-moving democracy, and that's a, that's a great word, by the way, in business. Democracy, we can make decisions as consumers really fast. And because of that, we can vote with our money with who we agree with, which is the reason why sometimes I think the government should just stay out of it. Because by the time they make a decision on Google, it's going to be too late. Oh, you know, we'll have, oh made, we'll have made yeah, it's already, the, the market will have decided 100 times over. And they've already been outdated. By the time the decision comes yeah. out, that technology's already moved on, whatever yeah. it is. I did see a restaurant once take the B and then write the word breakfast. Best. Oh. <laughs> so they just added extra letters to the bottom. It's yeah. Smart. Instead of cleaning, getting rid of the cockroaches, they just, <laughs> they just decided to work decided on their side. work with it. That is kind of Roll interesting. Roll with the B. So, uh, yep, good B. All right, so um, let's move to the topic that I want to wrap with, which is education. I'm going to give you a statistic, and then I want to ask you what you're doing about it. Um, according, according to recent congressional testimony, uh, math and reading scores on the National Assessment of Education Progress Test, quote, have been almost stagnant for 17-year-olds the final product of our elementary and secondary system. Almost stagnant, by the way, means the last the number I looked at was uh, 30 years ago, the average grade was a 355 out of whatever the number was, and now it's a 357. During that time, in 1979, Jimmy Carter uh, created and launched the Department of Education. The Department of Education typically spends about $105 billion, with a B, mm -hmm. dollars a year, and for 30 years, test scores have remained the same. What's up with that? We are not doing our job very well. <laughs> Using our money wisely. I think, you know, when you look at the current education model that we have, it is incredibly outdated. 
And I was reminded, I used to be a financial analyst after I got out of college, and I remember running into departments that would spend their entire budget for the whole year. And I would look at the department and I was like, what exactly do you do? Like, where, where, where is this money going? And they're like, well, it's just for our budget. If we don't spend it. Yeah, we lose it. We don't get it yeah. next year. Yeah. How many offices still exist in public education that are simply spending their budget every year because they don't want to lose their jobs? I mean, I understand. I get it. I, and, I, and I can relate to that. And, and sometimes you get kind of lost in your own shuffle. Maybe you've not realized that what you're doing isn't as uh, necessary or isn't really where we should be with education today. And so the Department of Education, I don't think, has done an incredible job of helping reshape how we teach and what we measure. Yeah, and things are moving faster. So I mentioned in the beginning of the show that Jabez is not the kind of guy to just talk about things. And then, you know, I, we were joking one day via text and I said, I said something like, yeah, we should just complain about this for a while and never do anything about it. And the joke was, he always does something about it, you know? Um, so you saw, man, there's an issue with education. You also recognize that that that, that those issues almost always uh, affect lower income or disadvantaged kids the most. Yeah, it's uh, disproportionate. Because if you, have, if you have plenty of resources, you can find a great school to go to, you can get great uh, supplementation at home sure. or whatever. And not every student that has money does. Right. But it is more likely that you will have. So what's your solution, access. man? What are you doing? We are just completely reshaping the whole model. Uh, why why go why shoot for such a low why, goal? Yeah, why, you why can just go do so, the whole thing. It it we I wish that it was as easy as an after school program or a little something that you could interject into the the current system. And I wish it was as easy as charter schools. I wish it was as easy as oh, we just need public schools to just change a couple of little knobs and everything's going to work out great. The the problem is the it's like a train. Right. with set tracks and those tracks are going this way period and yeah you can change the cars and the train but you're still ending up at the same place and that's not where we need to be we have to re uh, define and, and adjust how we go about delivering the education how we go about measuring um, I remember when I was in school taking math in like grade school and the teacher were like what are you going to carry around a calculator with you everywhere you go well, surprisingly, yes. Yes, I As a matter of fact, I am right now. <laughs> so, we, we ha it's not that we should. You're going to have the internet in your pocket, right? Something everywhere like that. you, you can go. look up words whenever you want to. Uh, pretty, pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. And, and it's not that we do away with literacy and math and, and history and all of those education subjects. We change how we teach them and why. Mm. And what are we trying to teach? Really, we start need to start moving towards a competency based model where you don't just understand how to regurgitate an answer, you understand the reasoning behind the answer. So you're launching a school. We are. We're opening right, right now. And you're just two months away from opening, actually, with your first class of 20 students. Yep. What does Sisu Academy look like compared to, uh, it could be the local public school, the local private school. How does it, how does it, how does it differ? So we, this first program is targeting specifically underserved students. So we've added an, an interesting component, which is boarding for underserved youth. That's so great. we're free so that they have a place to stay in a safe environment. Not every school we open is going to be boarding. Yep. Um, I think that fundamentally what separates us is a, a focus on competencies, for one, a focus on skills outside of the textbook, traditional core skills, so public speaking, financial literacy. Really? Yeah. Wow. Heaven forbid. The things you um, need. The things you might need actually out in the real world. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and, and grit and determination and, and like teaching students how to fail. Huh. Like if you ever notice we go A, B, C, D and we skip E and we go to F, <laughs> yeah. it's the only letter grade that stands for a word. Failure. Oh, F. That's F, right. That's the letter right. F. It's the Is only... that why we skipped to F? I, we must. I've never been able to find <laughs> another answer for it. That doesn't make any sense. Like, why would you do that? I Unless some, it was on purpose. I got some Fs. Yeah, I got tons of Fs. <laughs> and, and any entrepreneur would know that failure is a part of growth. Yeah. It is a part of it. A very important. In, in, any per, Anybody. Literally. You go to any adult and talk about how did you get to the, where you're at today. They're going to talk about some of their failures. And that's because that's part of life. But we need to teach that. How do you fail appropriately? How do you fail the right way, intelligently? Um, and then entrepreneurship is a huge underpinning of our program because our students need to learn what it means to be an entrepreneur. That doesn't mean they're all going to start their own businesses. But those same skill sets are applicable to any job. Absolutely. Or any, even being, if you want to be a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad, yeah. entrepreneurship is a, a set of skills that you will take no, with you no and question. will crush whatever you do. Yeah, and as a business owner, 
uh, we hire innovators. You hire people who think independently. Like I don't want to spend, I'm on the road for the next 10 days. I don't want to spend any of that 10 days managing processes that should have already been managed. You want to be have people that be able to do that on their own. So it's great. We kick that down the can down the line, right? So we yeah. say K through K through twelve. Well, their job's to get you to college, and when they get to college, they'll figure it out there. And then they get into college, and they're 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 like, well, okay, we're going to give you the framework to then go into life, and then go learn it, and then maybe go get your master's or whatever. But we don't. We, everybody keeps saying the next phase is when you're going to learn this, and I don't understand why we're not stepping back and saying, well, maybe we should be starting, yeah, way earlier. And then that's just the way that it is. And if you choose to go to college, great. If you don't, okay. But let's you know, let's start making good citizens that are well informed and capable of tackling problems. Like we graduate game changers that are problem solving people. Yeah. That's our goal. Not- Tell me a story. You've got some new students coming in. To do. Just give me an example of maybe one or two, and tell me tell me their story. For all intents and purposes, if you ran into them on the street, they're just a normal. You know, we're all girls. Our first school's all girls. Yes. They're just a normal 13-year-old girl, right, walking down the street. Um, one of them, her mom's in prison. Her dad's a mechanic. Wow. Uh, she's got two older sisters who are in and out of the juvie system. And her dad, you know, we do home visits and, and family visits with every family. And he just said, I, I just can't, she can't go along the same path. I can't let that happen. And I see that because she's not getting any support at school and he's doing his best, Right. but he's really struggling. We have another student, you know, it's really funny. She calls herself a little extra. She's big, <laughs> big personality. Like this student has a big personality. And because of that, she was getting bullied um, in, like constantly at mm-hmm. school. And it got so bad. That, so she's mom's single mom. Dad's out of the picture. Uh, they live with her grandma and oh, wow. she, she just couldn't handle it anymore at school so her mom pulled her out and her mom's like I don't know what to do like her mom makes $35,000 a year oh man and in, 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 in Southern, Southern California, California that's that's yeah. not a livable wage here and, and it's it's really tough for them to have options and, and to know where to go and they need a program that embraces the student for who they are mm. and gives that student an outlet to go express themselves so you're so school's free uh, school's you're free. dependent on raising money uh, I think right now to yeah. be able to get this thing launched and I think it's been interesting, you know, we, my wife and I have been donors to the school. I know several of your other ones, the folks mm-hmm. that we used to run businesses with and stuff. And uh, I, th- I get a great big smile on my face because the political spectrum of your donor base is literally completely all over the map. I mean, you've got some uber rights and a whole bunch of lefts and a whole bunch all in the, the middle. Board. And yeah. apparently that didn't stop people from supporting a cause that was worthwhile, right? No, not at all. It, it's, been, it's been interesting. There's people that we've been in conversations with, um, some foundations um, a certain set of brothers that yeah. we were in conversation with that if you'd asked me 10 years ago if I would be, you know, talking to them about... They make documentaries about them nowadays, do. you know, and but apparently they're yeah. interested in helping yeah. education, but you know? The more I've gotten to know them uh, uh, through their, their foundation, the more I've understood that some of the things I thought maybe weren't 100% accurate yeah. about what they're actually all about. And I'm, I'm learning that about a lot of our donors, where I, I just didn't know that they really were into this thing for this reason and that like you know they want to help students find their way in life yeah they want to help families who you know are in need and struggling they want to, and, and it's been it's been humbling to to get to have that sort of interaction with well i mean go back to our original premise so you've got a dad who's got three kids two of them are in and out of juvie and the other one he really wants to help he's looking at you and he's like is there's anything that you can do it would be great because i really want her life to be different and if you take a person on the far right of the political spectrum and the far left of the political spectrum and you put them as an observer in that scenario, there's not a person who would go, who would say that's not a problem. <laughs> you know, they would all identify the problem and we'd start to diverge a little bit on what to do about it. But the thing that I really want to kind of hammer home, especially as we wrap up this interview, and I've been joking about this, but Jabez is the guy who saw that situation. Like most people, and I'm, I'm going to cut myself sometimes in this, most people see that. And then go off to like Starbucks, buy four dollar cup of coffee, and then like whine about it and complain about it, and then feel, and then you go home and feel like you did something about it. You know, like yeah. I, I heard a, a guy uh, from India, and he, he called America the, the land where, uh, the land where once someone has learned something, they feel that they have done something. You know, and I'm like, that's actually good. That's, that's interesting. really interesting, right? But you're the guy that did something about it, and I think that's really important as we kind of wrap this up is. Is yeah, we don't agree on everything, but we do agree about doing things about things because ultimately 
your solution you're going to find through trial and error, trial and error, and finally you're going to hit it and go, that's the one. And you're going to see the success that you want, and then you're going to multiply it about a thousand or a hundred thousand times, or I don't know how many times you want to multiply it across the world a lot, right? That is the yeah, vision, right? It, absolutely. I mean, we're 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 in this to to help that part of our our world. Yeah. Um, there are lots of places where people can be passionate about what they're passionate about, and I encourage everybody to run into now is to take some time to put in some thought, not just go pack a bag of groceries or school supplies, and those are important needs too. Those volunteer needs are important. But use the skills that you have, whatever those skills are, whether that's a trade skill, whether that's you're you know a good mechanic, whether you're good at wood building, whether you're you know an entrepreneur or a doctor or whatever skills, and don't give those skills. And so like you know I sold my company and my wife quit her job and we went full time on this two years ago yeah. to start a nonprofit where we're not making any money, specifically to put our skills at work. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. I want you to think about this. The company that we started that you recently sold, that was a seven-figure company when you left it. I mean, so it yeah. wasn't like it wasn't like uh, small potatoes, but you did it for a reason and you did it for a purpose and a passion, and I love it. Uh, as you know, we support it and we continue to. Um, I want you to tell the listeners and viewers how they can find out more about your school. Yeah. Uh, and if they want to get involved as on a donor level, uh, this, this wasn't part of our agreement coming into the interview, but I do want people to know because I'm going to get questions about it anyway. So tell them a little bit about yeah. where they can get involved and then we'll put a link on the lower third. Uh, definitely uh, sisuacademy.org. That's S-I-S-U academy.org. And Sisu's Finnish. There's no direct English translation, but it stands for the concepts of grit, determination, perseverance, and stick to it. Oh, that's cool. Which I think is a skill that we want all of our kids to have. Yeah. All right, so that's Sisu, S-I-S-U, academy.org. At the very least, uh, look, it may not be right for you to donate as a, uh, financially now, but, but at least go there. Uh, just hit the website, learn a little bit more about the initiative because part of the part of the, the first three episodes of this show were called What's Wrong with America and How to Fix It. And part of it is identifying what's wrong. But the next part is fixing it. Uh, and you've done a really good job of identifying what's wrong, interestingly, like I said, in a very nonpartisan way. Uh, and he's got a way to fix it. All right, so we're going to wrap up. But before I do that, any last-minute thoughts on anything that we talked about today? I, I would say I encourage people to find people who have, like, opposing political views. Pick one issue that you can at least agree is a problem and then have a cup of coffee. Or a beer. It's a great. It's a, it's a great exercise. I told uh, I, I have a friend of mine who um, lives in a uh, in a bubble, <laughs> and <laughs> uh, and we were talking about something, and the way that her eyes went back and forth, I'm like, what, like she not even wasn't, even, and I go, like, let me ask you a question: How many of your friends or the people you follow online approve of the president? And she goes, none. And I go, statistically, like. Anywhere between 40 and 43 people on any given week say they approve. So if you're not following 43% people, you're not getting an accurate slice, <laughs> yeah. you know? And, and by the way, it's true for both 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 sides. Uh, and I love what you just said. Take, find someone you disagree with, get a cup of coffee, and seek like, um, I think it's Covey who says, seek to understand, not to be understood. Seek yeah. first to understand, not to be understood. All right. That's my man, Jabez Labrette. Check out Sisu Academy. My man, I love you and I Thank like you. you. Oh, Both of those things sense. together. Uh, and I'm so proud of what you've done, man. It's just an honor just to be just to be a part of this movement. And I, uh, I'm i looking forward to the day five or ten years from now when it's nationally known. It's on Forbes magazine. And, you know, you're the man of the year on the – or maybe your wife could be woman of the year instead. <laughs> that sounds good. Uh, and, uh, and I'll be like, I remember when I knew it way back in the beginning. So, um, so I appreciate it. That's Ed Talks. We'll see you next week. This is what we believe and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks.